Howdy folks, welcome to another nice new update for the ROAM. Now in this update we don't have any fancy new blocks for you, but we do have fancy new things for old blocks. In this case this is the GUI update. Now you no longer need to use the NBT edit mod and the confusing syntax in order to change block settings. Let's look at an example of a GUI, the signal block. Now here you have a pretty obvious looking GUI. First off, you've got an optional locomotive label field. Right now, the signal block will interact with any locomotive, but if you give it a local label, it will only interact with locomotives who have that label on the side of their engine. Also, you have two settings here. One deals with locomotives that have throttles over a specific value. The other one deals with locomotives that have throttles under a specific value. Note though that the under value is negative 1. Before you come at me saying, what if my locomotive is going backwards, isn't that a negative throttle? I want you to keep in mind that this is throttle, not reverse. The signal block works with absolute values. So a locomotive going backwards with a throttle set to 20 in reverse is considered to have the same throttle value, or 20, as a locomotive that's going forwards with a throttle set in forwards. This is to allow you to use push and pull configurations on locomotive trains and won't mess up with your locomotives that way. It also makes it a little bit easier to calculate speeds so you don't have to say okay is my locomotive going backwards but am I simply running them backwards on a one-way line or did I not have a chance to turn them around. Either way, let's look a little bit closer at all this stuff. So right now, locomotives that have their throttle over 999 will have it set to zero. This obviously will never occur. Similarly, the locomotives will never have the throttles under negative one, so this statement won't occur. If though, you set this value here to 50, you set that value to 30, and you set both of these to something like say 45 between them, you've effectively created a speed zone. So any fast locomotives will get slowed down to 45 and any slow locomotives will get sped up to 45. This setting here is a lot more useful than the old way of doing things in that you can use it near stations and other sections where speed is a crucial factor. So, fast locomotives coming into your station will get slowed down, and slow locomotives departing your station can get sped up. A lot more handier in a single package. Let's look at this in a uh, real application, though. This guy here works with any locomotive, and if the throttle's over 5, sets it to 0. This basically is going to cause the locomotive to come to a rolling stop. It won't actually stop the locomotive though. As you all know, that's the job of the station block. Now the station block interacts only with locomotives that have their reverse or throttle set to zero. You also get the shiny new GUI. Once again, you have an optional locomotive label, so even though I don't have this set to anything, it did stop the locomotive with label 001. What's key about the station block is that he has three modes of working with locomotives. Once it grabs a locomotive, it will send them off based on a time delay, a schedule, or simply redstone input. Now the redstone input should be obvious. You just take some redstone, attach it to the block, and if it's on, it sends them off. The time delay is also pretty simple in that after a specific amount of ticks, or in this case, 700, the locomotive heads out. Scheduling option is also pretty simple. You just have to note that the departure time is based on Minecraft's internal clock. So if I set this to say 6000, that's going to correspond to high noon. Over here at the throttle set section is also pretty obvious. That's going to be how fast your locomotive comes out once the station block activates it. Note though that unlike the signal block, this is going to put this guy forwards no matter what. If I was to give him a negative value, it would send the locomotive backwards. 
There's no relative, oh, he came in going forwards, negative 20 is going to send him out backwards, or, oh, he came in backwards, 20 is going to send him out backwards. This is because the locomotive, when it comes in, has a reverse of zero. So the station block technically can't figure out which direction he came in. It does make it a bit easier, though, if you have a station that you want to reverse your locomotive on, say at the end of a line where you can't turn him around. Just set that to negative 20, and he'll go back the other way. A little treat for you all, though, is the whistle mode option for the station. Now, previously, you were only able to tell the locomotive to just whistle during arriving at a party, and you might have found that a little annoying. Well, we've tweaked it a little bit. Now you get four whistle modes. You can turn it off. You can set it, the locomotive to whistle when it arrives at the station, when it departs at the station, or when it arrives and departs at the station. You also have a volume and pitch setting. Now this is similar to the play sound command in that the volume lets you increase the range the whistle is heard from. It doesn't actually make it louder. This can be pretty nice though if you want to make it so your entire town knows that your locomotive has arrived or that the sunset train is about to depart. Similarly, the pitch only allows you to slightly speed up or slightly slow down the locomotive whistle, but it does allow you to put a little bit of personalization into your lines. There's one more block that we have a GUI in, and that is the pointer block. Now this guy has just a few options. First off is the obvious one is that you can set a local label in here, and if the locomotive matches a label, he'll get sent to the destination here. This can either be the siding, which is going to be your branch line there, or it can be the main line, which is going to be straight ahead. This holds true for all switch tracks. Now, in this case, other locomotives that don't match that locomotive label are going to get sent to the siding. But what if you don't want this? What if you say, just want to interact with one? Well, you can click that, and you can tell it to ignore other locomotives. This way, if you have a locomotive that is a automated one that runs online used by other users, they can still work your switches, but you can make sure that your automated transit one gets where it needs to go. The final option here is redstone control. If I enable this, all of these other settings get disabled. As you saw, the pointer just flipped itself around. This is because with redstone control, if you provide the block with a signal, it will switch locomotives to the branch line. So, that one goes straight ahead, but now that he's a redstone signal, that pointer flips over, and this next locomotive here, number two, is going to get sent over there to the siding. Now, this isn't just a tutorial little update on GUIs. It's also a bit of a tutorial. So I'm going to show you how this funky little mechanism works. Now, over here, near the entry to this, what I like to call, station area, is a detector block. When that locomotive passes that detector block, it's going to obviously detect it and output a redstone signal. Similarly, when this locomotive leaves the station, he's going to trigger this detector block. As you can see, that also outputs a redstone signal. Now both these redstone signals feed into this funky looking little redstone device over here. Now the way this guy works is that every time he receives a signal, he toggles his state. So. Right now, he isn't outputting any redstone. Since he's not outputting any redstone, this pointer block isn't sending anything to the siding. However, once that locomotive number one comes into the station, he'll trigger this detector block. When he triggers the detector block, this will change its state, causing this to be on, causing that pointer to switch over. And voila! 
you basically prevent rear end collisions with your locomotives. Now over here on the siding, we have a bit of a funnier looking contraption. Right now, this, since this guy isn't receiving a redstone signal, he's active. Giving a signal block a redstone signal causes him not to work. So, he's going to turn this locomotive's reverse to zero, causing him to slow down and get caught by the station block. Now the station block is set to redstone, so the only way this guy is going to get out of here is if he gets a redstone signal. And the only way that's going to happen is once that guy leaves and triggers the detector, which causes that to change and sends him off. Note though the repeaters. Those suckers give a slight delay between when that guy passes the detector and that guy gets to leave. Effectively making it so this guy doesn't tail that guy out of the station, which can cause problems on switching tracks. This setup is especially useful for long lines where there's only one track, but you need to have locomotives going two ways on it. Just set up a couple of these things at each end, and voila, you've got a controlled line. Problem is, is that you're going to have to run redstone con to connect all your detectors and stuff together, which, with chunk loading and all that, is going to be a pain in the butt. I suppose you could go modern and use a wireless redstone device, but personally, I prefer the old-fashioned way, which is just schedule all your locomotives on a timetable. You can do that using the scheduled option in all your station blocks, which basically allows you to say, this locomotive left at 6, I expect him to be there by 8. I can send the other locomotive down the track the opposite way at 9. But it's your call. Now this deals with track logistics, but what about a factory setting? Now over here, I've got a tank. Now this valve block only outputs redstone if there's liquid in the tank. So if I go over here, grab some water, start putting it in the tank. That guy is going to activate, causing this guy to turn off, causing this signal block here to become active. So when there's water in the tank, this signal block stops trains. Now there's a pointer block over there that lets only the tank train come over here. So you can know you'll actually get something worth stopping. Now you might say, oh, wait a minute, there's redstone on here. You're going to stop the locomotive and the station's going to start them again. You would almost be right there. And that the tank block, when it's working with the tank, outputs a redstone signal through a comparator. If you hook this up to an inverter, then whenever he's working with the tank cart, that won't turn on. Which means the only time the station will release the train is when he's done emptying the tank, or when your tank cart's full. Either one. This is pretty nice. The problem is, is you have to make sure your blocks are spaced pretty well, in that you want this guy to first catch a train, set him to zero, he then should roll a bit and get out of the range of him before getting in the range of the station. While he's rolling though, this guy needs to catch the tank cart. The key here comes that you don't want him to catch the tank cart before he's left the area of this guy. If you do, he'll catch the tank cart, this will turn off, the station block will catch him, and this guy here will be active. Although it actually isn't that bad, because once this gets empty, that will shut on, so this guy gets disabled. Really you only have an issue if you can't use comparators or something to detect the level of a tank. Note though that this situation here is only valid if you're draining a tank and trying to fill a tank cart. If you flip this to try and drain something, note that that comparator is still going to be off. You can always add a little bit of liquid, though, 
which will cause this to become active and the whole thing to start again. The problem arises is if you have a tank cart come that drains your entire tank, you won't work anymore. But if you're planning to fill your tank from other things, such as a build craft, oil factory, whatever the heck you use, then it probably will work. It's just something you need to keep in mind. Well, that's about it for this little intro. Hope you all enjoyed the mod, and keep yourselves posted. If you all have any other suggestions, though, stop by the forum. Always eager to try new things out. This is Don Bruce, signing off.